Hello, everyone, and welcome to yet another number theory lecture. Uh, today we're going to talk about divisibility theorem. And we'll look at a few examples first, just so that we can appreciate the theorems that we come up with. Uh, notice that 4 divides 36. 4 times 9 is 36. 12 divides 36. 12 times 3 is 36. So the question is, does this imply that their product divides 36? If we have two divisors of 36, does their product also divide 36? Reasonable question. Let's see. Four times 12 is 48. And that does not divide 36. Uh, 36 can't have a divisor larger than it, larger than its own absolute value. So here's 4 times 12, 48. That does not divide 36. We have two divisors of 36, 4 and 12. Their product, 48, is not a divisor of 36. Uh, let's consider another example. And what should we do now? Uh, let's stick with 36. 6, six is a divisor of 36. And 9 is a divisor of 36. And again, the question is, does this imply that 6 times 9 divides 36? And we'll put it to the test. And 6 times 9, that's 54. And 54 certainly does not divide 36. Again, Six is, a, 6 is a divisor of 36, 9 is a divisor of 36, but their product, 6 times 9, is not a divisor of 36. And let's look at one more example, okay? Four is a divisor of 56, and seven is a divisor of 56. Uh, does this imply that their product, four times seven, divides 56. Okay, 4 times 7 is 28. Ooh, this time the product does divide 56. Here we have 4 times 7. Well, uh, here the product of the divisors divided 56. The other two times, uh, the product of the divisors didn't divide whatever number we were working with. Well, let's 
look at a divisibility theorem that will shed some light on this. Okay. I'm going to call this divisibility theorem 1. If A divides C and B divides C, and the greatest common divisor of A and B is 1, in other words, if A and B are relatively prime, then their product divides C. If A is a divisor of C, B is a divisor of C, and A and B are relatively prime, then their product is also a divisor of C. Okay, let's do a little retrospective here. divisor of 56, and 7 was a divisor of 56, and their product, 4 times 7, was also a divisor of 56. Greatest common divisor, 4 and 7, is 1. 4 and 7 are relatively prime. They are relatively prime divisors of 56. So their product was guaranteed to be a divisor of 56 also. Let's look at another example. This was the first example that we looked at. 4 was a divisor of 36, and 12 was a divisor of 36. Four times 12 is 48. Oh, 48 is not a divisor of 36. But now at least we can see why this failed. This was 4 times 12. And the greatest common denominator of 4 and 12 is equal to <laughs> 4, which is not equal to 1. Greatest common denominator of 4 and 12 is not equal to 1. So if I didn't really know how things were going to work out, what could I conclude here? Therefore, there is no guarantee times 12 will divide 36. Now, why did I say that? Well, let's look at our theorem again. This says if A does divide B and, I'm sorry, if A does divide C, B does divide C. And if their greatest common divisor is 1, then their product will be a divisor of C also. But this doesn't tell us what will happen if the greatest common divisor is not 1. This theorem just says that if A and B are divisors of C, and A and B are relatively prime, then their product, A 
eight times B will be a divisor of C. But this theorem doesn't tell us what will happen if they're not relatively prime. Okay. So we looked at our example. 4 is a divisor of 36, 12 is a divisor of 36. But 4 and 12 are not relatively prime. There was no guarantee by this theorem that their product would divide 36 and, in fact, it did. Well, let's look at uh, another one of the examples that we just did. That we saw this example earlier. 6 is a divisor of 36. 9 is a divisor of 36. Their product, 54, is not a divisor of 36. Well, what went wrong? Well, this theorem doesn't tell us that 6 times 9 will be a divisor of 36. It also doesn't tell us that 6 times 9 won't be a divisor of 36. This theorem really doesn't apply because the two numbers, 6 and 9, are not relatively prime. So we have divisors of 36, but this theorem doesn't apply because the divisors are not relatively prime. So there's no guarantee that their product will divide 36, and in this case it didn't. Greatest common divisor of 6 and 9 is equal to 3, and that's not equal to 1. Our theorem could not guarantee times 9 would divide 36 because the conditions of the theorem, the hypotheses, were not satisfied. The greatest common divisor of 6 and 9 was not 1. So as soon as we saw that the greatest common divisor was not 1, we could think the worst and say, you know what? Their product might not divide 36. Now, was it an absolutely surefire thing that this product would not divide 36? Uh, no, because this theorem just didn't apply one way or another. It didn't tell us, since this part was not satisfied, the theorem didn't tell us that AB wouldn't be a divisor of C, and it didn't tell us AB would not be a divisor of C. Since this hypothesis was not satisfied, this theorem just told us nothing. Well, one more example. Let's look at this example. Choose a divisor of 56. 14 is a divisor of 56. Greatest common divisor of 2 and 14 is 2. These two things are not relatively prime. So their product divides 56 times 14 is 28, and 28 does divide 56. 28, this is 2 times 14. Well, wait a minute now. These two things are not relatively prime. Their greatest common divisor is not 1. 
and yet their product does divide 56. Why is that? Uh, again, this is part of our hypothesis. And in this case, the hypothesis wasn't satisfied, so our theorem tells us nothing. It doesn't say that the product of those two things will divide C. It doesn't say the product of those things will not divide C. Greatest common divisor is not one. So we don't know, just based on this theorem, whether their product will divide 56 or whether the product won't divide 56. Well, then what good is this theorem anyway? Well, it's valuable in the case where the hypotheses are satisfied. We did this before. 4 divides 56, 7 divides 56. But 4 and 7 are relatively prime. So we know right now their product, 28, will divide 56. In this case, where 4 and 7 are relatively prime, their product will divide 56 because the hypotheses were satisfied. Well, why go through all that trouble? I, I know when 28 divides 56, I don't have to see if 4 divides 56 or 7 divides 56. Well, the true beauty of this theorem and the true value of this theorem is working on problems where we're not working with integer constants A, B, and C. But we're not working with integer constants like 4 and 7 and 56. Uh, we're working with variable constants, uh, integer variable constants, A, B, and C. And in a case like that, uh, we're doing problem solving, and we happen to know that A divides C, B divides C, and that A and B are relatively prime, then we'll know that A times B, the product, will divide C. So the value here is when A, B, and C are integer variables, and we're doing some sort of problem solving or proofs with A, B, and C. Here's our next divisibility theorem, Euclid's Lemma. It has a name, you better know it. The theorem, that is. If A divides B times C, and the greatest common divisor of A and B is 1, then A divides C. If these two guys are relatively prime, then A divides C. Okay, let's look at some examples. A, which is 9, divides the product of B and C. But 9 doesn't divide 12. 
y. Our theorem, Euclid's lemma, doesn't apply. In order for our theorem to apply, A and B have to be relatively prime. So let's say A and B. A is 9. Shoot. Ah. A theorem doesn't apply. Part of our hypothesis is that the greatest common divisor of A and B is 1. Well, the greatest common divisor of A and B here is 3. Our theorem doesn't apply. So as soon as we see the greatest common divisor of A and B is not 1, then it could be the case that, hmm, let me label this. It could be the case that A does divide C, or it could be the case that A doesn't divide C, because the theorem doesn't apply. Our hypothesis is not satisfied. And in this case, uh, the conclusion is false. A doesn't divide C. Nothing wrong with our theorem. Our theorem just didn't apply uh, because the greatest common divisor of A and B, 9 and 6, was not equal to 1. Uh, let's look at another example. Slightly new example. A is still 9, B is 4, C is 18, and B times C is 72. Just a different factorization of 72 this time. And it turns out that A does divide. <laughs> It turns out this time that A does divide C. Well, what's the difference? In this case, the theorem applies. In this case, the theorem applies. The greatest common divisor of A and B is the greatest common divisor of 9 and 4, which is 1. And our theorem guarantees that A divides C, that is, 9 divides 18. Here's an example that's a bit more to my liking. Suppose that we have that 6 divides 9C. Can we conclude that 6 divides C? 
ha, 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 let's see. Here's our A, here's our B, and we'll let C equal C. Six does not divide nine, where six is A and nine is B. I'm sorry, this is all nonsense. What am I looking for? I'm looking for my hypothesis to be satisfied. Greatest common divisor of A and B is greatest common divisor of 6 and 9, which is 3, and that's not equal to 1. Greatest common divisor of A and B is not 1. can't conclude anything as far as whether 6 divides C. Theorem doesn't apply because this hypothesis, this hypothesis is not satisfied. Greatest common divisor of A and B is not one. So hey, uh, does A divide C? But we don't know. Can't tell. Let's look at another case. Let's look at this one. 6 divides 25C. Can we conclude that 6 divides C? Well, let's see. We're told that A divides BC. What's the greatest common divisor of A and B? Here's B right here, 25. Greatest common divisor of A and B is the greatest common divisor of 6 and 25, which is 1. The hypotheses are satisfied. Theorem applies. Whoops, whoops, whoops. We can conclude that six divides six. Okay, everybody, let's prove these theorems that we used. Uh, divisibility theorem one, if A divides C and B divides C, and A and B are relatively prime, then their product AB divides C also. Hmm. 
Okay, let's prove this. And usually when I do a proof, I hit the chicken switch right away and just say, let the hypothesis be given because I'm not sure how to proceed, so I'm stalling here. But it's not a bad thing to do, uh, to start the proof by stating the hypothesis. So let the hypotheses be given. Suppose that A divides C and B divides C, and the greatest common divisor of A and B is 1. Okay. Time to take my foot off the chicken switch. Uh, I still don't have any idea what to do. So I'll just take my hypothesis or my hypotheses and see where they lead me. A divides C. This means that there exists some integer R, we'll call it R, A divides C means that there exists an integer R such that C is equal to AR. Now what do I do? I don't know. So I'll try to see what another hypothesis can do for me. Since B divides C... What does that mean? There exists an integer, we'll call it S, such that C is equal to DS. And what do I do with both of those? I have no idea. I still have one more hypothesis to use. Greatest common divisor of A and B is 1. Well, what do we know about something like that? Take any two integers A and B and we can find other integers X and Y such that AX plus BY is the greatest common divisor of A and B. And here the greatest common divisor of A and B is 1, which means we can find integers X and Y such that AX plus BY equals 1. Now what that has to do with what we're trying to prove, I have no idea. But we do know it's true. Now, let's, let's write this down and see where it goes. Since the greatest common divisor of A and B equals 1, there exist integers X and Y such that AX plus BY is equal to 1. Now, this appears to have absolutely nothing to do with what we're trying to show. And yet, this is going to be very useful.
you know what? I'm going to take this thing and multiply both sides by C just so that I can get C involved in this equation. C is equal to C times 1. But 1 is this side. Okay, I'm stuck. I don't know what to do, so I'm going to distribute the C here. CAX plus CBY and I'm trying to show that the product of A and B divides C. It would sure be nice if this term had a factor of AB and this term had a factor of AB. Then it would be obvious that AB divides this entire expression and it would divide C. The problem is I don't have a B here and I don't have an A here. Uh, or is that a problem? Let's see. I don't have a B in this term, but I do have a C. And C equals BS, so I'm going to replace this C with its equivalent. BS I'd love for this term to have both a factor of A and B. I only see a factor of B. But C has a factor of A. So in this term, I'm going to take C and I'm going to replace it with its equivalent, AR. R, R, R. Yep, uh, all I did was replace C with its equivalence. And now we have a factor of A and B here, A and B here. Son of a gun, I'm going to factor out AB from the first term. And that leaves me with SX. I'm going to factor AB from the second term. That's going to leave me with RY. And I'm going to factor AB out from the entire expression. That'll leave me with SX plus RY. And note, S is an integer, X is an integer, R is an integer, Y is an integer. Integer times integer is integer. Integer plus integer is integer. This thing is an integer. So what I have is C equals AB times Sx plus Ry, where Sx plus Ry is an integer. And that means AB divides C. Ah, we did it. And you know, you know what the craziest thing about all of this is? is that greatest common divisor of AB equal 1 meant that there's a linear combination of A and B that equals 1. And this fact turned out to be very useful in the proof. Now, who would have guessed that we could use this to prove anything? Uh, I'll tell you what. It comes in handy in a lot of proofs, especially when we're absolutely certain 
that this fact will be absolutely useless. It comes in very handy. Okay, let's prove divisibility theorem 2, also known as Euclid's lemma. If A divides a product of BC and A and B are relatively prime, a and B are relatively prime, then A divides C. That's what we're proving. Again, I'm going to hit the chicken switch. I don't know how to start this proof. So I'll say, let the hypotheses be given. What are the hypotheses? Let's say A divides BC and A and B are relatively prime. Okay, I still don't know what to do, so I'll just see where this hypothesis takes me. Suppose that A divides BC. Now, what that means is A is a factor of BC. So there exists, let's say, an integer N such that BC is equal to A times some other integer N. Okay. So that's what this hypothesis tells me. Uh, A and B are relatively prime. Greatest common divisor of A and B equals 1. What can I do with that? There, there, there's no reason in the world to suspect that this thing implying that there's a linear combination of A and B that will equal 1 is going to be helpful in this proof. But I can't think of anything else to do with the fact that the greatest common divisor of A and B equals 1. And if the greatest common divisor of A and B is equal to 1, hey, if I write this down and it doesn't pan out, it doesn't mean it was a bad idea. It just means it was a good idea that just didn't prove fruitful. That's all. Since greatest common divisor of AB is 1, there exist integers x, y such that AX plus BY is equal to 1. There's a linear combination of these guys that equals 1. Okay. <laughs> now I'm trying to show that A divides C. C is equal to C times 1. Let's just try it and see what happens. C times 1. This is stupid. There's no reason to believe that it would work. And if it doesn't work, okay, we'll just go back and try something. C is equal to C times 1. But 1 
is equal to AX plus BY. And I'll distribute the C. CAX plus CBY. Uh, and I have no idea what to do, so maybe I better look at the problem and figure out what it is I'm supposed to be proving. Let's see. If A divides BC and A and B are relatively prime, then A divides C. Okay, I'm trying to prove that A divides C. And I have C equal to the sum of these two terms. A is a factor of this term. If A were a factor of this term, I could pull a factor of A out and I'd be done. Uh, ooh, 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 ooh. CB here, BC there. BC is equal to A and there's my factor of A. BC equals AN. Uh, almost certainly that's going to get me where I want to go. So I have CAX plus BC, which is AN. Let's see. BC is AN times Y. Okay. And I can factor out an A from each term. CX and NY. And notice retrospectively that C is an integer, X is an integer, N is an integer, Y is an integer. Uh, this is the product and sum of integers, so it's an integer. C equals A times garbage, CX plus NY. And that's an integer. Hence, A divides C. Ah. Who would have thought that this fact would ever come in useful? A and B are relatively prime, so there exists a linear combination of A and B that equals 1. Sure did come in handy, didn't we? We'll remember that. <laughs>